Hello, everyone, and welcome to Drug Notes. Uh, drugs and crime are very closely related. Drugs lead to the majority of arrests that we have in the United States, uh, primarily because we have such uh, strict drug laws, if you will. So, a drug in general is a natural or synthetic substance, and it's designed to have some sort of effect either physically or mentally on a person, uh, or an animal, or a plant, okay? So, it's meant to have some sort of effect. We do have controlled substances uh, that are restricted by law. So, these are the more... Um, notorious drugs like cocaine, meth, uh, marijuana, um, stuff like that. Uh, the Controlled Substances Act was created in 1970, uh, and it lists drugs, their categories, and the penalties for possession, sale, or use of those drugs. So, the Controlled Substances Act is divided into five schedules. So Schedule 1 is your highest potential for abuse. Um, there's currently no accepted medical usage in the United States. Marijuana is the first one on Schedule 1 to take that uh, change. Um, medicinal marijuana is being used more and more. However, federally, it is still on Schedule 1. So depending on the state you're in, uh, they actually had a lot of issues. So like when Colorado became one of the first states to have medicinal marijuana, they had a lot of issues with the federal government coming in and arresting people for having large amounts of marijuana because they were selling it medicinally, but they were getting busted for having so much because it hadn't moved off of the Schedule One drug level. Um, it's still that way to this day. I don't know if it will change. Um, but Schedule 1 is your most uh, restrictive of all the schedules. So these are the drugs that have the most uh, potential for abuse, uh, and they are not prescribed at all, okay, with the exception of marijuana, like I said. Schedule 2, uh, again, has a high potential for abuse. Uh, but it currently has some accepted medical use, uh, but there's a lot of restrictions involved. Uh, usage of these drugs can lead to severe mental and physical dependence. So a lot of times they will allow them to have the prescription once and that's it. Uh, or it's like if you're in the hospital, you can be prescribed it, but not when you're outside of the hospital because you have to be under direct doctor supervision. Uh, prescriptions for this have to be written in ink or they have to be typewritten uh, and they have to be physically signed by the, uh, the doctor. Um, in cases of emergency, they can have a handwritten letter within 72 hours, but everything has to be handwritten or typed uh, and physically signed by the doctor in order to be used. Uh, these would be things like cocaine, morphine, uh, amphetamines, including methamphetamine, uh, PCP, Ritalin, um, a lot of um, stimulant drugs that we have have some sort of amphetamine or methamphetamine in it. So, and they usually fall into Schedule 2, and they are very um, restrictive with their usage. Schedule 3, lower potential for abuse. Uh, you can have prescriptions. Uh, you can have up to five renewals within six months. Um, these are things like uh, barbiturates, which are a depressant, uh, anabolic steroids, uh, ketamine for veterinary use. Uh, Schedule 4 are even lower potential of abuse, uh, but a lot of Schedule 4s are ones that people will highly abuse. They are, um, they are things like Valium, Xanax, Librium, uh, Oxys. Um, oxycotton, oxycodone. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if oxycotton and oxycodone bounce up schedules uh, to a schedule two or a schedule three uh, because of the highly addictive quality of those drugs. Uh, prescriptions for this one, uh, same thing, you can have five renewals within six months. Um, very limited physical and, me physical and mental uh, dependence.
And then finally, Schedule 5 has the lowest potential for abuse relative to the other ones. Uh, there's currently accepted medical use in the United States. Um, these drugs are subject to state and local regulation, and sometimes the prescriptions are not required. Um, examples of this would be like codeine found in low doses in cough medicine. Uh, also, over-the-counter prescriptions or, or over-the-counter drugs sometimes will fall into Schedule 5 depending on what's inside of them. Uh, you hear a lot, of top, a lot of talk of what is illicit and what is illegal. So illegal drugs are drugs that are against the law to have, use, or distribute. Can't have them, you're not supposed to have them, you're not supposed to use them, you're not supposed to distribute them. Those would be things like Schedule 1. Schedule 1 are illegal drugs. Uh, illicit drugs are drugs that are legal, but you're using them in an in inappropriate or illegal way. So you're abusing prescription meds. So you have a Schedule 4 drug like Xanax, but you are abusing that, that prescription. That now becomes an illicit drug. So illicit drugs are legal. They're just used in the wrong way. And illegal drugs are just banned no matter what. When they go in to do drug tests, uh, they will do drug tests in a couple different manners. Uh, the first three on this list, uh, blood, urine, and hair, so these three right here, uh, are the ones that they can use while the person is still alive. Okay, They can take a blood sample, they can take a urine sample, and they can take a hair sample and do the drug test from those. Uh, these ones down here at the bottom, gastric contents all the way down to the vitreous humor of the eye, these are all post-mortem tissues that they test when they do a toxicology screen. So, uh, most of them are self-explanatory. The vitreous humor of the eye is the actual liquid that is found inside your eyeball. Okay? So they would have to stick a needle into your eye, pull out the liquid, and then test it. If the person was alive, they would no longer have vision in that eye if that was done. Uh, doctors have to know a ton of medications, same with pharmacists, uh, and so they use something called the physician's desk reference. Uh, it is a giant book with all of the prescription medications that are out there in the world. They even have uh, pictures of what the drugs look like. They have, excuse me, they have um, descriptions, side effects, they have everything that you need to know about every single drug that is out there on the market. Uh, I've used them before when I found drugs at school. So if somebody dropped a pill and I want to find out what that pill is, I go to the physician's desk reference to look it up to find out what it is. So uh, if you arrest somebody or somebody's taken into custody and they have an unknown uh, powder on them or they have an unknown substance that they think is a drug, uh, they will go through and do screening or presumptive tests so then they can determine if they need to go further and do confirmatory tests. So the screening and presumptive tests are things like a spot or a color test, uh, which you will do a lab in the next couple days on that. Um, the microcrystalline test uh, is where you add a reagent to the drug and it will produce a crystalline precipitate or a crystallized um, substance that's unique for specific drugs. Uh, and then you also have chromatography where you can separate out what's inside the drug. Uh, confirmatory tests are spectrophotometry and mass spectrometry, probably two of the hardest words to say in the English language. Um, but they both use uh, lasers and they both use um, light waves to determine what uh, is in the substance. And we'll get into that later on in the notes. So, like I said, screening or presumptive tests can only tell that the drug, the drug is possibly present. Uh, it's a quick and easy way to say, yep, there's something there, we need to go further with the test. Uh, if it's a negative screening test or a negative presumptive test, then there's no need to go further with the um, tests. Confirmatory tests are quite expensive. Uh, they will tell you if the drug is 100% positively present. Uh, screening tests are cheap, they're easy to use, and they will determine if you need to go further and do that more expensive uh, confirmatory test. Uh, the color tests or the spot tests, 
they have multiple different reagents, uh, and they will turn specific colors based on what uh, the drug is. So, uh, Marquise will turn purple if there's an opium derivative or a narcotic, and it'll turn orange-brown if there's an amphetamine present. Uh, Dil Kopniani turns violet blue in the presence of barbiturates, so purplish. Uh, Duquesne's Levine turns a purple color in the presence of marijuana. Van Erk turns a blue purple in the presence of LSD. And the Scott test uh, is a color test for cocaine, and it is a blue. It'll turn blue if it's positive. 